Okay, so uh, we have here a genetic overview of the Australian Terrier, and, uh, and that's a daunting title, but what we really are talking about is practical genetics for Australian Terrier breeders and owners. I'm not going to be throwing a whole bunch of fancy terms at you. Uh, it's just really what you need to understand about, about uh, heredity, about what's going on when you breed dogs, and, uh, and what you are seeing in your breed, and what, what we know that we see in your breed. So um, I will say that I am a, a, a volunteer member of the not-for-profit OFA. Um, and, uh, and so I will be talking a little bit about some of the tools that are available from the OFA uh, during the lecture as well. And then uh, just you know, so that you know, again, um, I am a, a breeder, although my wife actually makes all the breeding decisions, but, uh, um, but I, I, my name's on the, on the dogs as well. So um, this, is a, uh, um, this is my Bobby. Uh, who's uh, at home right now. This was the day that he got his uh, final leg of his junior hunter title and um, and his litter mate Maddie is being shown right now. Uh, um, she uh, actually right now is the number three all breed dog in Canada and uh, um, although she's in Michigan right now this weekend we're trying to keep up our points in, in the United States as well. So, so we are involved in the fancy as well. Okay, so our first poll is just uh, an orientation poll. So if you can go to the internet, uh, the easiest way is to go to the internet and uh, to the address pollev.com slash ATCA. The poll questions will pop up on your screen and you can just tap your answers in. Or if you want to text, um, the address you're texting to is 22333. And then in the body, um, one time only, in the body of the text, put in ATCA and hit send. And then from then on in, all you have to do is, is type in your, your number, uh, your letter answer A or B. So the question here is, I love Australian Terriers or I love Siamese Cats. We just want to make sure that you're in the right room and uh, that, uh, you know, that we are all here together. And then once you're oriented on this slide, from here on in, if you're on the web page, the questions will just pop right up for you as the slide comes up, or if you just text your letter answers, you'll get those. Yes? The URL is pollev, it's right up here on top, pollev.com slash ATCA. And if you're texting, the address is 22333, and one time only in the body of the text, you're going to text ATCA, send, and from then on in, you're just going to do your answers A or B. Whoops. Okay, we've got 10 so far. Just give you a couple more seconds here to orient. There we go, 13 of you, 14 of you. We got it. You know, once, once you're there, then it becomes easy from there on in because we're already on the slides. Okay, we've got 16 of you. If you're still working on it, keep on doing it, but I'm going to reveal the answers now. So it looks like 94% of you are, um, love uh, Australian Terriers, and, um, and we've got uh, a small percentage of you, 6% of you love Siamese cats. So... Those people can now leave the room and, and uh, go you know, chase a laser pointer or something like that. Okay, so the, uh, the next poll question is a, um, is a free form. So you're going to type in an answer. Um, and the question is, what is the biggest issue concerning Australian Terriers? And you can, you know, I mean, if you want to put in about judging at dog shows, you know, whatever. But, but I'm talking primarily about, about breeding Australian Terriers um, and being an Australian Terrier breeder um, and owner. What is the biggest issue that concerns you? And there's no, there's no um, uh, censoring or, or, or moderation on this. So please, you know, keep any profanity out of there. So a small breed pool, lack of genetic diversity, small gene pool, diabetes, uh, shrinking gene pool, lack of breeders and dogs. And it's, it's an issue for every single breed. Um, we'll go through that. Keeping the breed size from getting too big. Huh. So you got the opposite 
um, concern there. Um, health and longevity, maintaining a good healthy line. Diabetes, again. Consistency in type. Anyone else still working on one? Working. Okay. Anyone still working? Yep. Okay, let's get it in. You're writing an essay? Yep. Okay. Endocrine disorders, especially diabetes, health issues. Okay, so we're, we're concerned about the, the population. The biggest issue is a combination of understanding and maintaining a breed type and soundness as well as a lack of sufficient breedings being done. So, so a lot of you are concerned about the breed gene pool and, uh, um, and diversity. So we're going to be addressing that in the first half of the, of the seminar, what we're doing right now. The second half of the seminar is all about health, where we'll talk about uh, diabetes and other health issues and, and then how to breed away from uh, different uh, um, issues as well um, to wrap things up. Okay, so let's start with the registration statistics of the Australian Terrier. So we're gonna take the, um, the AKC, since we're here in America, even though it's an Australian breed, uh, we'll take the AKC statistics. And what I have here is starting at 1985 down at the bottom here and going every five years until 2005 and then going every year up until then. And of course, we don't have numbers yet from 2018. So this is uh, for 20, uh, 2017, the final numbers. Your AKC rank in terms of population and registrations, uh, this is for individual dogs, was 78 in, in uh, 1985 with 683 dogs registered. Five years later, you went to a, uh, 84th place with 607 dogs. Five years later, you went to 103rd, um, lost uh, um, over uh, close to 150 dogs um, born that year to 455. Uh, we uh, then went up uh, five years later to 497 dogs, five years later down to 416, um, and then uh, in 2006, 361, 404, 330, 2009, the recession hit. 2008, 2009 was the recession. Every breed saw a dramatic decrease in breeding uh, from 330 to 285, and through the recession, those numbers continued to go down um, and where you hit uh, the low point at 2014, and then the numbers had started to come up again. And this, again, reflects every single breed around 214 where the numbers start coming up, unless there are things other than the economy that was affecting dog breeding. Uh, so you went up, and, uh, and then 278, and then 266. So you haven't rebounded as much as, you know, as where you were in the 200s, um, but, uh, uh, and so that is something to consider and to think about, because as I wrote in the article, uh, the first article in your handout, um, if we're not breeding, then we're, we're losing. So you do have to breed, and some breeds and breeders are afraid to breed because of, of health issues or for one reason or another, but if you don't breed, you're gonna lose your breed. So, so you have to do the best that you can and you have to breed um, in order to maintain uh, your population. The, uh, the litter rankings are, you know, are similar to the, um, to the individual dog rankings in terms of the number of litters that are produced each year, um, so that reflects that as well. Okay, so the next part of the, um, of the talk has to do with uh, looking at the pedigree of dogs and what it tells us about the genes of your dogs, um, as well as looking at the entire um, breed gene pool. And, uh, and so what I did to, um, uh, to uh, individualize this to your breed is I received the computerized pedigree database from Jillian Bartlett in Australia, 
who maintains the online um, uh, Australian Terrier pedigree uh, um, site and, um, and analyze that. So that represents the entire breed worldwide, but it also goes all the way back to founders. And then I also received from Mark Dunn at the AKC um, the entire AKC registration computerized database. So every single AKC registered Australian Terrier um, was sent to me there. Uh, every computerized database has some limitations. They're not going to include um, all dogs if they've been uh, assembled by someone, and they're going to focus on when that database first started, and if they have older pedigrees, they'll put those in, but pretty much they're working from a, you know, I'm going to start making a database, I'm collecting catalogs, I'm collecting every source I can, stud books, and working from there. The limitation of the AKC database is that they went, uh, they completely changed mainframe programs in 1980. And so, um, all of, although they have on other programs and systems all of the pedigrees that go back to the original stud book, they aren't all on one specific system. So the database that I received from the AKC starts with the 1980 dogs as well as the dogs in their pedigrees that go back several generations, but it doesn't go all the way back to founders. Um, so, so those are the limitations there. But let's see what I was able to, to find out. So the first thing, here's our next poll question, uh, and it is, my last mating was an, or I prefer to do if you didn't have a last mating, and the uh, choices are inbreeding, line breeding, outbreeding, outcrossing, or crossbreeding. And, and you might say, can you please define those? And I will say, I will on the next slide, but you've got to answer the question as to what you think you're doing first. So this is what we want to do or what we did? <laughs> either way, either way. Okay. Anybody still having issues getting on the, uh, onto the polls? Everyone's good? Okay. Okay, so we've got 19 results. You can keep on entering if you want. We're going to reveal. Okay, so 5% uh, of you put down an inbreeding, 43% put down a line breeding, 24% now 27% put outbreeding, now 24%, and 29% put outcrossing. So uh, the majority of you do uh, line breeding, which is, which is correct. That's what probably most of you are doing. Um, outbreeding, 24, outcrossing, 29, and inbreeding, 5%. So inbreeding, I understand that as a breeder, inbreeding means father-daughter, full brother, full sister. It's very, very close breeding. Um, whereas to a geneticist, inbreeding is a number, is a coefficient, um, and, uh, and I'll define that to you. So every single mating in a purebred has some inbreeding involved with it um, that we can put a number on. Line breeding is breeding two dog, and uh, okay, so outcrossing um, is uh, what breeders say they do when they are outbreeding, okay? Um, and so let's define these for you. Inbreeding, breeding closely related dogs. Line breeding, a less intense form of inbreeding, concentrating the genes of a particular ancestor. And to know if you're line breeding versus outbreeding, you kind of have to know what is the average inbreeding coefficient in your breed. Because a line breeding will have a higher inbreeding coefficient than the average and an outbreeding will have a lower coefficient than the average of your breed. Is my, is my, you know, is my mating uh, tighter than the average of the breed? Is my mating, uh, you know, uh, going out, you know, less related um, between the two parents? Um, Crossbreeding is the breeding of two different breeds. So, um, you know, and so I, I don't think many of you in the room are doing crossbreeding. Crossbreeding is what is done for designer breeds where they're crossing two different breeds, um, or, or in some breeds that really feel that they have uh, limited diversity and issues, they may breed to another breed to bring uh, uh, new genes in in that way. But uh, the majority of you are doing line breeding or outbreeding um, in that way. And, and I know you use the word outcrossing, which is fine, but, uh, but as geneticists, these are the terms that we use. 
So when I look at uh, different dogs that are out there, um, there are three different populations. There's a purebred population, there's a designer bred population, and there's the original designer breed, the cockapoo. Um, so, so designer breeds didn't just start up uh, um, about 15, 20 years ago. They've been going on for over 50 years with the cockapoos. And then there are random bred. But also when I look at these three groups, I'm actually looking at two groups, okay? I am looking at purebred and designer bred as matings that are determined by a person, that a human makes a decision um, to breed one dog to another. Whereas random bred dogs, a human is not involved in that decision-making process. It's up, totally up to the dogs um, what they're doing. So, um, and so therefore to me, if, if a human is involved in a decision about breeding two dogs together, we have certain responsibilities in terms of health, in terms of what are we doing with that mating, um, as well as uh, many decision points that we need to consider. And so that's what we're talking about today. So here's one of my favorite comics, Get Fuzzy, um, and, uh, um, and the guy says, ever heard the expression familiarity breeds contempt? And Satchel sits there and thinks for a while and he says, no, in the dog world we say familiarity breeds hip dysplasia. <laughs> So this is the concept of the general public, that, that purebred dogs are inbred and inbreeding causes genetic disease. And so, um, you know, there's not, I mean, we can continue, uh, continually try to fight this notion, but, um, but it's written in the Bible and inbreeding is bad. And, and so it's, uh, it's something that we constantly have to fight because honestly, every single one of your dogs is inbred, okay? Because when you breed two Australian Terriers together, you don't get a Chihuahua, you don't get a St. Bernard. You get an Australian Terrier, and it's because all purebreds are inbred. And, uh, but, but there are specifics about what we've done to create our breeds that they are healthy and can be healthy. And that's what we need to focus on, not the fact that purebreds are inbred because they always produce the same type of dog. So I need to understand two specific uh, concepts in order to go through the next part of the, of the talk. Um, one is the inbreeding coefficient. It's also called the rights coefficient. And I'm going to read the, the uh, um, definition first, then we're going to break that down and go through it. It's the proportion of all variable gene pairs that are likely to be homozygous due to inheritance from ancestors common to the siren dam. Okay, so it's, it's a percentage. The inbreeding coefficient is a percentage of 19% or, or 5% or 20%. The proportion of all variable gene pairs. So the gene pairs that make a dog a dog are non-variable. And the gene pairs that make an Australian Terrier an Australian Terrier are non-variable. So all of those are fixed in your breed. You're always going to get an Australian Terrier if you breed two of them together. They do not vary. So an inbreeding coefficient is actually only measuring the variable gene pairs in your breed that are likely to be homozygous. Homo means the same, and genes all come in pairs, one of the pair from the sire, the opposite of the pair from the dam, and they match up together on paired chromosomes. And so if you have a big A and a little a that get matched up, um, that determines how they're expressed. The big A is a dominant, the little a is a recessive. Okay. If you have a large A and a small A, they are heterozygous because they are different. Hetero is, is unlike. Whereas if you have a large A, large A, they're homozygous, homo meaning the same. Okay. It, so we're looking at the proportion of all the gene, of the variable gene pairs that are going to be the same, homozygous, due to inheritance from ancestors that are common to the sire and the dam. So if a large A comes from one individual on the sire's pedigree, and it also comes from an individual, uh, that same individual that appears on the dam side of the pedigree, um, we can get homozygosity because that gene got passed in both directions um, to the offspring. Um, so it's the percentage that are homozygous. It doesn't mean the percentage that are large A, large A, that's homozygous. The percentage that are little a, little a, those are all getting added together. It doesn't matter what type of gene it is, it's just are they going to be homozygous, what's the, what is the chance? So if we say 19% as an inbreeding coefficient, we expect 19% of the gene pairs to be homozygous due to common uh, ancestry. 
The other way of looking at this number is the probability of an individual being homozygous at any single gene locus. What's the chance I'm going to be homozygous for X, okay, for a certain trait or, or whatever uh, type of gene? Um, and so there's a 19% chance a single gene pair is going to be homozygous if that is the inbreeding coefficient. Okay, the other thing I need you to understand is the relationship coefficient. This is a measurement of the probable genetic likeness between the individual whose pedigree you're looking at and a particular ancestor. So if you say, I'm line breeding on Sam, then the relationship coefficient tells you what percentage of Sam's genes you expect you, your dog to carry. Um, it's, the, um, it's the probable percentage the individual and the ancestor have in common from descent, and it's approximated by a percent blood calculation. So relationship coefficient is a very complex um, uh, uh, calculation. It involves the inbreeding coefficient of SAM. It involves the inbreeding coefficient of the dog you're looking at, um, but, but it can be um, very easily approximated by a percent blood, which means what are the positions in the pedigree that that individual came in. A sire passes on 50% of its genes. Uh, a, a grandparent passes on 25% of the genes. A great-grandparent, 12.5%. If an individual is a grandparent on one side and a great-grandparent on the other, the percent blood is 25 plus 12.5 or 37.5% um, for that dog. And you can go all the way back with the computerized coefficients all the way back to the 16th or, or 25th generation and every single time that they show up in those generations, it adds a little bit more to that percent blood calculation. Okay, so this is an analysis of the, um, of Ms. Bartlett's um, Australian uh, or worldwide um, Australian Terrier database. And this, uh, um, this is being recorded, so you're gonna have all this information. I know I'm going through a lot of information in the next three, in the three hours, so you'll have this to review and to pause and, and, and so forth. And so we're looking at dogs from the 1890s, um, from the 1890s here, we're going by decade. How many dogs are present in the database based on that? And you can see she pretty much started the database in the 1950s and all these dogs were in pedigrees that she added um, through the years there. And then this is the mean number of, uh, the average number of generations of each dog um, that are present. And so as you expect, the number of generations uh, increases as you go along so that the dogs in this decade that we're presently in, uh, there's uh, an average of 88 generations of the Australian Terriers. Um, let's go all the way to the right here, the mean number of unique ancestors that are in the pedigree. So a dog might appear several times in a pedigree, but it only is an ancestor once. Okay, so how many unique number of individual dogs are present um, in the pedigrees? 18.8 .8 on average in the 1890s, and that number also continues to increase as those pedigrees get deeper. So the, the total number of unique dogs that have been bred, so it's not the total number of Australian Terriers, but the total number of Australian Terriers that have been bred and are included in the pedigrees on the database, uh, 2,233.7, okay? So, the mean all generation inbreeding coefficient. So this is calculating the inbreeding coefficient going all the way back, as far back as the pedigrees go. Um, and this number, in a closed gene pool, if you are looking at every single dog that goes all the way back to founders, this number can only go up as you go from generation to generation. But the bottom line is, when you're adding pedigrees here, that pedigree stops. You've got a three generation or a five generation pedigree and those dogs in the back end, if you're adding them into the database and, you, and they don't connect to a dog that's already in the database, then, then that dog looks like a founder and, and therefore it's, you know, it's calculated as being zero inbreeding coefficient because it doesn't have any parents. All right. So, so the bottom line is these numbers, when calculating all generations, um, should go up over time, but as you're adding more dogs, it looks like it's going down because you're adding dogs with truncated pedigrees. And so it isn't until this area here that you then see that those numbers slowly go up each decade 
uh, as you would expect them to as you're getting deeper and deeper um, pedigrees that are more complete or at least complete going back to the early part of this of the um, of the 20th century. Uh, it goes down slightly here, so some new dogs were added um, that were born in this decade that did not have pedigrees that went back, and that's why it appears that number went down. What I like to look at, and what geneticists will look at to see what is happening in a breed, is a 10 generation inbreeding coefficient that only takes into account the last 10 generations in the pedigree. And so what that does is it tells us how that population, how your gene pool is moving through time in terms of um, are, you, you know, are you utilizing the breadth of your gene pool, are you narrowing your gene pool, what are you doing? So, um, and so when you have one generation uh, and then you go to the next generation, what's happening is the dogs that were in the 10th generation in the prior decade are now in the 11th and 12th generation and fall off the back, so you're not counting them to calculate that in reading coefficients. And so again, in this early part here, it's mirroring what you saw in the old generation in reading coefficient, but then as you get beyond 10 generations on average, you start to see these numbers go down from the old generation coefficients, and you now compare full 10 generation pedigrees and what you want to see is that they will go up for a point as people are solidifying the breed and forming the breed and selecting influential ancestors um, to, uh, to line breed on. And then over time, in the more recent generations, you want to see that number start to go down. And as that number goes down, the 10 generation of breeding coefficient, um, over each decade, that tells us that you are using the breadth of your gene pool, that you are using dogs that are less related to each other than the prior generation in doing your breedings. And this isn't because you are selecting um, only to outbreed versus to line breed, because everyone's going to do something a little bit different. But in, so it's not something that you fix these numbers by saying let's just outbreed or let's just line breed, um, it's, but it's the average of what is going on. Um, and, uh, and if you had a very strong popular sire syndrome going on where a, a breed truncates on a single individual or a single sire line, that average 10 generation coefficient will go up over time and that tells us that you're narrowing your gene pool, that, that their parents are now more related to each other than the prior generation and that's not what you want to see going on. So, so what we see here since the 1980s is that that number has been going down and that's exactly what we want to see. Um, and so here is the graph and again, you know, initially before the stud book is closed, things can go down as new dogs are added, but then this little dip here shouldn't be here. That's because of truncated pedigrees. Um, in general, these numbers should just continue to go up over time uh, for the old generation coefficient and then you want to see it slowly come down in the 10 generation coefficient. This last slide is using the AKC database, and as I said, it doesn't go back very far, um, but, uh, um, and here are the number of dogs that are, that are in that, pedigree, that registration database from the AKC, and uh, what we do want to see, because those pedigrees are all truncated, they don't go back to founders, I'm not giving you an all generation coefficient, but if you use the mean 10 generation coefficient, you can see that these numbers continue to go down over time and again tells us that you are utilizing the breadth of your gene pool um, in your mating. So that's a very good factor there. It's telling us that we're not lacking genetic diversity. It's telling us that you um, have a diverse gene pool where you have dogs available to you that are less related than the average for you to contemplate using um, so that you can outbreed if you want to outbreed, you can line breed if you want to line breed, and you have the, um, the genes to work with in your breed in that way. Okay, and, and then just to show you, um, you know, looking at, uh, actually for the entire breed, um, looking at the uh, 1990s to the 2000s, um, your 10 generation coefficient, 15.8, 14.3, that's where you're averaging for the breed. And so you compare it to other breeds in that period. Um, you've got uh, some breeds with much higher average coefficients, the Norfolks, uh, the Tollers, Scottish Deerhounds, 
um, bull terriers, so breeds that we know have, have more limited diversity and diversity issues that the breed is concerned with. You have breeds with very diverse gene pools, uh, short hairs and mastiffs and uh, Samoyeds um, and Bernese Mountain Dogs. You know, some people, because Bernese have a specific type of cancer that they're dealing with, and they're saying, well, it's because they're all inbred and, and it's a very inbred breed, it's actually an outbred breed. Uh, there's a lot of diversity in Berners, they're 11.32. Uh, you want to see a big surprise? Look at Bichon Frise. You know, everyone says, oh, well, that's, that's a huge breed, it's, they're going to have a lot of diversity. No, there's a huge popular sire effect going on where a, you know, a son was replaced by, uh, where a dog was replaced by his son and it was replaced by a grandson and the entire breed has truncated on, on, on a popular sire line. So they have lost diversity because of that. And you're kind of in the middle with the Briards, with the, uh, you know, with the Peers, with the Irish Setters, with the, you know, the, the, the Poodles, the, the Ridgebacks, the, the, the Siberian Huskies. So you're, you know, you're not too tightly bred, you're not completely outbred, and as a small population breed you wouldn't expect to be completely outbred. So um, you're really in a comfortable position with your meeting coefficients there. Okay, this next part I am taking the database uh, again, the worldwide database, and looking at who are the influential um, ancestors, the founders and the influential ancestors in your breed. So this is looking at an entire generation of dogs born in 1890 to 1899, and what ancestors are shared pretty much across every single pedigree. And so what we can say is that there's a dog, and I don't have birthdays in a lot of these because it's the really ancient, early, early um, pedigrees of your breed, but Northumberland Laddie, um, every dog had a relationship coefficient on average of about 11.6% to Northumberland Laddie. And you had Stanford Punch and Toodles and Bosco and Bloomsbury Dandy and Rothwood Nell, and these are probably dogs that you've never even heard of, and, um, and they are the originators of your breed in the 1890s, okay? If we then look to the, to the 1900s, all of a sudden these dogs that were very high, um, the, the top four significantly dropped down. Your numbers are getting much greater as well. These dogs here, I mean, they're still present in pedigrees, but they're not present in every dog's pedigree. And then you have some new dogs from the 2000s, from, from, I'm sorry, from the early 1900s that come in here, Bathurst Surprise, Lady DR, Bathurst Quiz, Tui's Nip, and Tarara, who jump in um, and start to be influential um, on average across the pedigrees. In 1910, now all of a sudden no dogs that were influential in the 1990s are on the list anymore. They're certainly back there, but they're not in everybody's pedigree. Um, you've got uh, these dogs from the 1900s continue to be influential, um, and you've got some new dogs uh, born in the early um, part of the decade, Malvern the Parisian, um, Brunda, Sandos, Lady Durbin, Johnny, um, Tui's Pride, uh, uh, Glenside, uh, Bonnie Jean, that start to become uh, influential. 1920s, um, you then see these same dogs, some of them increasing on their influence. Uh, Brunda uh, jumped up. Lady Durbin more than doubled her influence on the breed. Uh, Smoodra of Knoxville almost four times his influence. So people are starting to line breed on these guys because they're producing quality. This is why dogs get more influential, is not because they're popular sires, it's because what they produce is of quality, and what their offspring produce is of quality, so their influence continues to go up. And if that line stops to produce quality, that influence goes down. And that's, that's what drives the, the influence here. And then you've got some new dogs from the, the teens, Two Blues, The Color, Walla Walla, um, Affiance, Jip, um, and so forth. We've got the 1930s, and you've got some new dogs coming in. Karawa Nip, Penance Johnny, Newtown Prince. Now all of a sudden these are dogs that maybe you might have even heard of um, back um, in the early part because these are uh, uh, Karawa Billy, the other Karawa dogs. Um, you've got uh, uh, Marawa Digger um, that first shows up here. 1940s, um, Grendon Red Flare, Old Nell, Sturt, bunch of Sturt dogs starting to come up here. Um, Warawa Digger, um, Blue Metal, Brayside, Bella Marie, Strathdean, Hope Kelly. 1950s, um, you've got some dogs solidifying, Carowin Nip here, um, as well as Pennant Johnny and Newtown Prince. You've got uh, um, Strathdean Terry uh, start jumping in here to begin with. 
In the 1960s, again, Carolyn Nip increasing the influence. Grendon Red Flair, um, Strathdean Terry starts jumping up. Sturt Peg, Neurally, Sturt Major. So now dogs that are influential in today's dogs are showing up and starting to be influential from the 60s on. From the 70s on, again, Sturt Peg, Neurally, uh, Sturt Major, um, uh, and the Seven Oaks Silver Prince comes in that was born in 48. Um, Tara Lee dogs start showing up. 1980s, and again, Lady Durbin is behind everybody here. She still goes up, as does Carolyn Nip, uh, that, that first showed up in the, in the 1900s and, and in the 1930s. These dogs' influence are continuing to increase. Carowa Billy, um, you've got Sturt, Peg, and Neurally, now over 10% relationship to every single dog in the 1980s. So their influence goes up. Sturt Major, um, you've got uh, Maryvale, Blue Kim, and Tarly Lark start coming in here. 1990s, um, Elmora Cognil jumps in at 11.5, so a very, very quick, so probably a popular sire at that time that was born in 69, um, uh, now in the 1990s, over 10%. Uh, and, and these others that maintain their, their numbers here. In the 2000s, you've got Seven Oaks Woodpecker jumping in at 10%. You've got Tara Lee Teamster um, and the other dogs here that are, are um, still influential. Uh, and then in our uh, current decade. So Carowa Nip, Carowa Billy still, still high here. Um, you've got uh, Tarly Larch has jumped up. Um, Maura Cognil um, still staying uh, as one of the top individuals in your breed worldwide uh, that's influential in today's dogs. In the AKC database, so going back to the AKC database and linking it to the Australian database, so this took a lot of work on my part um, in that way, but just looking at the 80s, um, we've got some dogs that were not as influential on a worldwide basis, but are influential in, in the U.S. pedigrees. Lamar's Mission Impossible, have you heard of this dog? Nope. No. No? Okay, so he's, he's a very strong dog um, in your background in the 60s. Um, Tara Lee for Fame, Tenet Town Talkback, Tara Lee Larch, um, the Me Paz, Harry the Swagman, Me Paz, Joy of My Life, anyone heard of those? No. Okay. Um, uh, Silver, Silver Prince, you've heard of him, okay. Um, Carowa Nip, Carowa Billy, Old Nell, Carowa Faith, these are all the guys that were, you know, originated your breed that were early, early on. So in the 1980s, Janaf Jill, Sprightly uh, Frederica, Seven Oaks Winsome jumps in, Tara Lee Royal Feast, and Eunice's Ch Kojak. You heard of Kojak, right? Really? Okay, because he's, he's pretty influential. Um, and then, you know, as we go down, uh, you know, we continue here. So it shows that you have pretty much the same background, but because you are in America and you're not in Australia, you are concentrating a little bit different dogs than are being concentrated in the, uh, um, in the worldwide database. Ben Air, Georgie Boy, Wild Again, Rebus Tomfoolery. Okay. So that's just showing you the influence of how a breed develops over time. So now I want to look at a couple of individual pedigrees of dogs and talk to you about what the pedigree tells us and what you're actually doing to the genes of your dogs as you do your breedings. So the first one I'm starting with is a dog named, um, named Rebus Tomfoolery. What is his call name? What is it? Cisco? Okay, so Cisco was born on April 1st. He's a April Fool's dog, 2001. Okay, in the database he had 35 offspring. And so when you look at a pedigree of a dog, um, the first thing I do is I take out my colored marking pens and if I see a dog that appears more than once in the pedigree, I will put a, a particular color on it and that way it tells me the type of mating that's going on in the pedigree. So does anyone see any names that show up more than once in a three-generation pedigree? Okay, so John is low commotion appears on the sire side as a, um, as a great-grandsire and on the dam side as a great-grandsire. Anyone else? 
Okay, Rebus Apollani also shows up as a great grand dam on both the Siren Dam's uh, side of the pedigree, and they are actually bred to each other. So Rebus Hallis, Travelin, Matilda, and Rebus Batteries not included are what? So, so they're full brother, full sister. Okay, they are, are full siblings. You know, they could be littermates, but it wouldn't matter if they're littermates or not. They have the same pedigree. It could have been a repeat mating as well. And that really doesn't, for genetics, it doesn't really matter whether they're littermates or just full, uh, they are full siblings. Okay, so Reba, so the siren dam of tomfoolery, Reba's Diamond Jim and Reba's All That Jazz, how, what is the relationship between them? Or what type of mating would this be called? Not half brother, half sister, no. Nope. So if these guys are full siblings and their offspring were bred together, what is the relationship between? Okay, first cousins. So, so this is a first cousin mating, all right? Now the total 10 generation embryo coefficient of Rebus tomfoolery is 16.2. The, the first cousin mating by itself adds 6.25% to that embryo coefficient, just that relationship alone. So if we look, you know, here's what we call an arrow diagram of, uh, of uh, tomfoolery where, where the common ancestors are only written in once and you just have arrows that go to them. And if you see this hourglass configuration, that means that, that, that um, those two individuals um, share, uh, share offspring. So, um, so that's what that hourglass shows, that these two individuals are the parents of both of these guys right here. And so looking at that, that's a first cousin mating. The inbreeding coefficient from that is 6.25. The relationship coefficient of tomfoolery to locomo Janus locomotion and Reba's apple annie is 25%. So we know 50% to the siren dam, 25% each from each of the grandparents. Each of the great grandparents contributes 12.5%. But because they're appearing on the sire side at 12.5 and on the dam side at 12.5, they're now contributing 25% to the pedigree, the same as a grandparent in the next generation. However, their influence is more than a grandparent, even though they're both at 25%, because a grandparent's genes are paired up with genes from the other side and are only influential on one side of the pedigree. Whereas a common ancestor's genes are being passed down on both sides, can get paired up in the individual and therefore be an entire gene pair from that ancestor and be more influential than genes that are getting acted on by the opposite of that gene pair. So line breeding makes an individual more influential than just a single individual that has the same percent, percent blood that only appears on one side of the pedigree. Okay, and so in the handouts, uh, you see you have this information where a parent to offspring or full brother, full sister has a 25% inbreeding coefficient, uh, father, granddaughter, 12 and a half, half brother, half sister, 12 and a half, uncle, niece, 12 and a half, and full cousin at six and a quarter. And then these are the relationship coefficients or the percentage of blood from each of those um, individuals in that, uh, um, in that pedigree. So this is the entire inbreeding coefficient of Rebus tomfoolery. And as we said, the inbreeding coefficient was 6.2%, which is just slightly above the average for your breed. The um, Janus locomotion, Rebus apple, Annie, each have 25%, as we said, 12.5% from each side. They don't appear to the third generation, but they each appear two times in the pedigree. Tower leaf uh, fakir, is the next most influential individual in the pedigree, doesn't appear till the fifth generation, but appears 41 times in the pedigree. Um, he was born in 1973. Um, Tarley Larch contributes 19.6%, um, doesn't appear till the sixth generation, but appears 119 times in the pedigree, and Larch was born in 1970. So the most influential dogs in your pedigrees are dogs from 50 years ago. And this is how your breed was formed, and this is what everyone's pedigree is gonna look like pretty much. They're gonna have a little different variation in these guys, but they're going to be there. Um, Barberry Hedge, Reba's Dundee, 18.8. 
um, doesn't appear until the fourth generation, appears um, four times. Uh, I'm not going to pronounce that one. Uh, 17.2. Uh, Tara Lee Zigzag doesn't appear until the seventh generation, was born in 1965. Um, 14.2. More than a great grandparent doesn't appear until the seventh generation. Um, Seven Oaks Woodpecker. Um, doesn't appear to the eighth generation, appears 1,554 times, and he was born in 1950. So he contributes almost as much as a great grandparent and doesn't appear to the eighth generation and is a dog from 1950. Um, Royal Standard, um, Royal Banner, the Tara Lee dogs, Dan Buster, Kathy Z. Um, these dogs were, um, I don't have all of them in here. Um, and then Crestwood's Cracker Jack uh, contributes 9.4. It doesn't appear to the fourth generation, appears four times in the pedigree. So this is a typical pedigree um, of one of your dogs. Um, next, I'm going to look at Crestwood Cracker Jack. Have you heard of him? Yeah. What's his name? Jack. Yeah. Okay, makes sense. He was born in uh, uh, May of 27th of 1979. Um, he has 153 offspring in the database, so he is certainly a, a prolific dog. His inbreeding coefficient is 3.2%, uh, both 10 generation as well as, uh, as all generation coefficient. What does that make him? Outbred. Outbred. Very good. Give that man a prize. So, um, so he is an outbred individual. There's no individuals in a three generation pedigree that are in common. And as a matter of fact, you have to go back several more generations before you find a common ancestor. So the most influential an, um, individual in the pedigree is Seven Oaks Woodpecker um, that was born in 1957. Contributes 14.4% of the genes to Jack, appears 19 times. Uh, Janeth Jill, who was born in 1952, 11.5%, doesn't appear till the sixth generation. Seven Oaks Blue Spriggan, 11%. Uh, Sturt Mr. Chips, Seven Oaks Silver Prince. So, so these are all dogs that you saw on the influential ancestor chart as we move through the generations. Um, Silver Prince is from 1948. He doesn't appear till the seventh generation, appears 4,774 times. Uh, Seven Oaks Winsome um, from 1950, Sturt Peg from 1932 uh, um, appears 13,290 times, Sturt Bessie appears almost 100,000 times, doesn't appear till the 10th, whoops, till the 10th generation, Carowa Nip appears 174,434 times, doesn't appear to the 11th generation, contributes 6% of the genes to every dog. Um, to Jack as well as just about every dog in your breed. Yes. Question: When you say it shows 174,000 times, yes, is that in all pedigrees? But not. No, this not, is in. That's not in Jack's pedigree. Yeah, that's in Jack's pedigree. pedigree. 174,000 times. Yes. In Jack's pedigree. Yeah, but you're going back. You know, he doesn't even appear until the 11th generation, and you're talking about him appearing from the 11th generation all the way back to the. 20th or 30th generation. So you're, you know, you're looking at millions of positions of that pedigree that a dog can show up. If I, stupid me, if I'm going backwards, say I'm taking Bessie and going backwards, right? Yep. There's 174,000 times to get to Jack out of her? Yes. Yes. So theoretically, he's related to 174,000 mating? So he has 174,000 offspring in the pedigree. Now, now some of, you know, m most of those are going to be the same dog. So, so Jack, so uh, Nips, you know, got a, an offspring that was prolific. His offspring were prolific. Their offspring were prolific. So, it's, so it's going to, you know, going, you know, it's not that that Nip had 174 off, thousand offspring, but it's it's, <laughs> but it's how many times that he appears in that pedigree. Yes. Okay, so this is a dog that has, in my opinion, been bred many times for having diabetes forming our. Right. So. So, and I was told, I was told that Jack is being blamed for causing diabetes in your breed. Yeah. Right. So a, so a couple of reasons why I included Jack's pedigree is first to show you that what's behind Jack is behind every single one of your dogs. Okay. So every single one of your dogs has what's behind Jack. And I also want to point out to you, as we'll talk about in the second half, 
is that diabetes is a worldwide um, disorder in your breed. And it's a high frequency disorder in every single Australian Terrier. Okay, Jack wasn't exported to be put into every single pedigree worldwide in the Australian Terrier breed. So, so he is not the cause of diabetes. All right, he's just, he's just a prolific dog you know, at the top of the list in terms of how many offspring he produced. So everyone points at him and, say, and is going to blame every single issue in your breed on him because he's there. Okay? And so that, you know, that's part of the blame that, that, that gets put on a popular dog. And, uh, and it is unfair, and I can tell you that uh, I don't know whether Jack was, you know, helped you know, pass along more diabetes in your breed or not, but I know that you didn't need him to do that because it was already there um, in that regard. Okay, the last pedigree I'm going to show is Dilly's Mr. Redland's Buddy. Anyone uh, hear of this dog? I mean, I just picked it out just because it shows you a little bit more of the things that can go on in a, in a, a pedigree. This dog was actually born in 2003. He had 21 offspring. And what I want to show you is that um, Kojak's Elmo up here and Mandy Sue, these two dogs as a, as a, um, as a pair, are also the siren, they're the siren name of Leon Lee Blue, they're also the siren name of Perky Penny Pie. They also, <laughs> they also are two generations behind Tinsley's Honcho. They're two generations behind Tinsley's Little Aussie. They're two generations behind Weaver's Cork, uh, Corky Aussie Terry. Is this a U.S. dog? This is a U.S. dog. It's not a puppy dog. I don't know whether it is or it isn't, but but the bottom line, it probably, you know, it could be. But you've got Eunice dogs here. I mean, Eunice is not a puppy mill, okay? That these are these are dogs that are behind just about every single dog in your in your breed. So um, so these are dogs, and this is why this dog has a very high inbreeding coefficient that it is tightly bred. I mean, it's why, do you say, why do you say that Eunice is not a puppy mill? Um, because it's it could be a puppy mill. But what I'm saying is I'm seeing, you know, I'm seeing these dogs behind, you know, when I look at the registration database of the AKC, I'm seeing these dogs as influential ancestors, which means that, that they've been, you know, they, they, they are spread throughout your, your gene pool. Now, maybe, maybe that's a big puppy mill factor. I don't know how much of a puppy mill factor Australian Terriers have as a smaller breed. So it, it could be, all I can say is that these guys are influential in your breed, okay? And so, and so these are, this is the, this is the numbers here for um, Dilly's Mr. Redland's buddy, uh, almost the same as a, as a parent for those two dogs, Kojak Selmo and Mandy Sue. Um, Eunice's Kojak um, is, is based on the AKC registrations, is very influential in your breed, you know, she, and she may not be a member of the fancy, she may have come from a puppy mill, but there's a lot of breeding that goes back to her. Um, and these other guys back here as well. Um, and all this is within the first six generations. If we go all the way down, you're gonna find all the rest of the dogs that are behind all the rest of, of yours as well. Um, if we had a complete pedigree database that went back to founders, um, you would see uh, there would be dogs here that appear over a million times. You know, when I, when I go to complete databases that, are, that go all the way back, um, you will find dogs um, that are over a million uh, times or hundreds of thousands of times that they appear. And that is very common. That's just the background of your breed. And this is why I say all purebreds are inbred because they all go back to the same individuals. That's how your breed's formed. It's not a bad thing to say. It's just a fact as to what it is. We need to get over it. Our dogs are inbred. And, uh, but, but the question is, are they healthy? That's, that's what we need to concentrate on. The last thing I want to show you in doing this area here is that, um, is that when you look at the inbreeding coefficient of dogs, you need to use the same number of generations to compare one dog to another. Um, uh, because as you get deeper in the pedigree, that inbreeding coefficient is going to go up as you use more and more ancestors to calculate that coefficient. So Rebus tomfoolery was a first cousin mating, so, so with three generations only had 6.25%. So it should be 6.3 there. Uh, but then as you go further back, you get more and more common ancestors that rise that number up. 
Crestwood's Cracker Jack was, was an outbred dog, so the first instance of a common ancestor was only in the fifth generation, but, but those, the individual that showed up once in the fifth generation then appeared several times a lot lower down, so it only added 0.1% to the inbreeding coefficient, and as you get more common ancestors added, um, you get down to his 3.2. And Dilly's Mr. Redland's buddy, um, 6.2 based on three generations, but then because of those, um, that breeding pair that appeared multiple times, his numbers jumped up quickly and then remained about the same as you got further down the line because those were the major influence in the breed. So you do need to compare the same number of generations if you're looking to say this dog is more outbred or more line bred than another dog. Okay, so to understand about breeds, you have to understand about breed evolution. And so what I've been talking to you about um, here is the evolution of the Australian Terrier breed. The development occurred through artificial selection for body type, color, coat type, behavior, um, working ability, co and conformational aspects. So this is what was selected on to create your breed. As breed lines became more specialized and stud books closed, those who did not conform to the standard were removed from breeding, and those that did not pass on that standard were removed from breeding. Um, studies of dog breeds estimate that they lose on average a third of their genetic diversity through breed formation, just by eliminating those that have issues that are not you know, passing on uh, what you want. And I would say for many breeds, it's probably even more than, than a third of the genetic diversity. But this is, you know, and everyone says, well, we shouldn't lose genetic diversity. It's good to lose genetic diversity if it's bad diversity, if you're losing bad things. Okay, but that's why we become inbred, and that's why we become, you know, able to reproduce what we want to reproduce. This is a pedigree. Whoop, this is a pedigree of an average Australian Terrier back to founders. Okay, so all the way over here are the original founders of the breed, and they are bred to each other, and a standard is established, and and so this is the founding population of the breed, and then the breed. Ex Pool, gene pool expands, and then you've got some more purging of undesirable stuff here and expands, and then finally we get to a point where you have a rapid explosion of the gene pool here in numbers, um, especially since the pedigrees are being put in in this period here. And then this is a single dog, and it's sire, and it's dam, and it's grandparents, and it's great-grandparents, and so forth. So this is the part of the pedigree that we, that we expect to look at, that we're used to looking at, this is the part of pedigree I'm, that I'm talking to you about when I'm looking at these deep pedigree analyses. Okay, that's what a pedigree of your, of your breed or of any breed is gonna look like. So it's what I call a diamond, some of them are much more diamond shaped, but it's diamond shaped in here in terms of going back to a huge population of dogs and then truncating down to the founders um, of, of the breed. So modern breed population statistics show high deep pedigree average inbreeding coefficients, low effective population size. Effective population size means how many dogs would it, at the minimum, would it take to explain the genetic diversity of a breed? And it's only gonna be about, you know, for most breeds between 10 and 20 dogs would explain the diversity of an entire breed. But that's, that's what breeds are about, and, and if you were a, conservation geneticists trying to rescue endangered species, you would say you can't live without 50, without an effective population size of 50 dogs. That's not what we have. In, I, I think one breed has over 50, is Labrador Retrievers, just by sheer numbers, okay? Um, no other breed has 50, as it, um, but the bottom line is, is that selection, Breeds are all about selection. We have selected for what we want. And it doesn't matter if some dogs are almost carbon copies of each other. It's not what we want in wildlife, where you want the most diversity because you're not selecting against the bad things. Nature is selecting against the bad things. So you want greater numbers in the background, but that's not what we see with breeds. High average relationship coefficients to influential ancestors and these ancestors appear in the pedigrees of every member of the breed with genetic contributions of anywhere from 15 to 33%. Healthy gene, uh, breed gene pools require expanding or large stable populations. So this is where I talk to you about, you know, you've got good numbers, but you don't want to see those numbers continue to go down. 
And the economic contraction that occurred because of the recession, we lost a lot of dogs. And it's okay to lose a lot of dogs as long as we don't lose a lot of lines. You know, if lines are still maintained, but the numbers aren't there, but then those lines can then continue to contribute and expand. So we don't lose the, 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 the breadth of our gene pools, that's okay, all right? And then we'll get the numbers back. But if in that contraction, we lose lines, if, if breeders that, um, that have you know, excellent lines and they, and they you know, get to be your you know, senior members, you know, breeders in your breed, and then they stop breeding, if no one's breeding their lines, that's a bad thing. We need to continue those lines. We don't want to lose those lines. Um, a, a large, stable population or an expanding population allows the creation of new family lines. When you bring lines together and create a new line, allows for within breed diversity, which is important, that the difference between your dogs, that there is difference between your dogs. You don't want to homogenize your breed by everyone outbreeding, um, and I'll talk about that, because then you lose the difference between dogs. So if I want to select for something else, I can't select anymore. You need differences in the background of dogs to be able to select. Um, population contraction causes the loss of breed diversity and quality breed lines. Selection of breeding animals should represent the quality traits and breadth of pedigree background. Quality lines should not be abandoned. So let's talk about the popular sire syndrome. <laughs> so, so this is a geneticist's view of a, of a pedigree. Squares are males, circles are females, horizontal lines are matings, and vertical lines are offspring. So let, let's say that this represents a diverse gene pool, and then all of a sudden a male comes along and everyone oohs and ahs and says, oh my god, this is the most amazing specimen of an Australian terrier. Everyone flocks to him and wants to breed to him right away. So a lot of different bitches with a lot of different backgrounds get bred to him, and everyone likes what they see, um, and, they're, you know, and so his genes are getting spread far and wide. They start line breeding on him, and this happens very, very quickly within, within, a, you know, within a decade, you know, within a short du duration that, it, that this dog's genes are spread far and wide. It's the single most influential factor in restricting the, the breed gene pool diversity. So if you're worried about diversity, you need to be worried about the popular sire syndrome. The overuse of a popular sire quickly disseminates his genes throughout the gene pool without the benefit of evaluation over time. And it causes the loss of other quality male lines that should be contributing to the gene pool. So there are only so many quality bitches that are getting bred each generation. And if a disproportionate number of them are all going to a single sire or a single sire line, other quality males that should be bred are being sidelined and you are losing those quality male lines. And that's where you know, the issue of the popular sire syndrome comes along. A popular sire's influence is different from that of an influential ancestor. Some people say, well, what about you know, Carawa Nip and, and you know, these dogs that are contributing high, high percentages? An influential's ancestor's contribution is continually evaluated through its descendants who will have to compete with others for breeding status. If a popular, so, so you know, every generation, a decision is being made to breed to that descendant of that influential ancestor. Every single generation, if that ancestor's line is not passing on quality, then it will diminish and not be an influential ancestor anymore. Whereas a popular sire, you're just breeding because of the popular sire and not because of what has been produced. And then the other deleterious thing of the popular sire syndrome is if a popular sire is found to pass on deleterious genes and all of a sudden, you know, three generations later, it's like, oh my God, how can we get rid of this? Um, the resultant purging process also causes the loss of influence of the quality dam lines to which he was bred. So you'll lose an entire generation of quality dam lines if you have to purge out a popular sire that passed on serious issues. Okay, so this is, this is the issue that we have with the popular sire syndrome. Okay, so let's quickly talk about um, the population aspect of diseases and disorders, or what I call, get ready for it, the dark side of breed development. <laughs> <laughs> so all individuals carry some deleterious mutations. Quality individuals who propagate will also propagate their deleterious mutations. Everyone's got some, okay? 
These can cause breed-related disease if they are disseminated and increase in frequency through founder's effect or through, you know, through popular lines. Breed pop propagation must always include active monitoring, breed health surveys, and selection against genetic disease. Without this selection, the genetic health of the breed will decline. Genetic health of dog breeds is not a direct function of homozygosity or heterozygosity. So some people say, you know, if your inbreeding coefficient is too high, it's an unhealthy breed. That's not the case. It has to do with deleterious genes of the accumulation of specific disease liability genes. So with breed maintenance, some registries or some individuals in response to perceived uh, concerns with genetic diversity propose only outbreeding to the least related individuals and banning close matings. However, it's selection and not the types of matings that affect breed uh, diversity. So Mars Optimum Selection has been touted as a breeding tool, and what it's telling you is, is to look for, it's going to find dogs that are the least related to your dog, and therefore that's the, that's the perfect dog to breed to. You know, dogs that carry chromosomal segments that are different from your dog, and so it's completely an outbreeding type scheme. And there's nothing to do with health in there. There's nothing to do with, with the quality of the dogs in there. So it really is not the right way to go. Breed gene pool diversity requires distinct lines to create selective pressure. Outbreeding plans are self-limiting because as you remove the genetic differences between individuals, it becomes increasingly harder to outbreed or find mates that are genetically unlike each other. If you've got the two most unrelated individuals, you breed them together, they're now related in the offspring. So that offspring, you need to find someone else that's unrelated and then bring it together. And their offspring, you need to find someone else that's unrelated. You're going to run out of unrelated. Everyone, instead of being around the periphery and very different from each other, which is what you want in a breed, is in the middle of a circle and they're all the same. None of the types of mating systems change the frequency of defective genes or their dissemination. Outbreeding will not change the frequency of deleterious genes. And for breed-related deleterious genes like diabetes, outbreeding will not reduce the frequency of affected individuals because those genes are dispersed. So it doesn't matter whether you line breed or outbreed, your chances of getting these breed-related diseases are going to be the same. Affected individuals will be produced in a random fashion. If you want to know what, what that looks like, look at our domestic cat breed, uh, our domestic cat populations. 95% of America's cats are random bred alley cats, okay? diabetes, inflammatory bladder disease, inflammatory gum disease and, and bowel disease. You know, all the big diseases that we see in, in mixed breed cats, those are all genetic diseases, but they occur at a random basis as opposed to a familial basis because um, they're random bred. Genetic diversity is breeder diversity. That is my mantra. If it's the varied opinion of breeders as to what constitutes the ideal animal and their selection of breeding stock that maintains breed diversity. When breeds have issues with genetic disease, the only way to improve their gene pool is through genetic testing and selection against the specific diseases and their associated liability genes. Okay? You don't make a healthy dog just by looking at an inbreeding coefficient or a number. You know, if, if, if there are issues in a breed, they're due to specific genes that cause specific diseases. And you need to select against those diseases in order to improve it. Pre-breeding health screening should become as universal as equine pre-purchase exams. So this is one of my new mantras, and this leads into the second half after our break, um, is that you know, no one buys a horse without having a vet look at the horse and, and doing a, a pre-purchase exam. Because if it's got laminitis, if, it, if it's got stuff that you're never going to be able to ride this horse, why would you purchase it? Okay. Um, it's a, so equine pre-purchase exams are standard. You know, if you buy a horse without a pre-purchase exam, you're really gambling as to whether you're ever going to be able to use that horse or not. So pre-breeding health screening should become as universal. That, that before you breed a dog, you should check it for all of the known and, and general disorders. They should have a heart exam, they should have a, you know orthopedic examination, an eye exam, and if there are genetic tests that are available, those genetic tests should be run. And it doesn't mean that you can't breed that or don't breed that dog, but you breed that dog with your eyes wide open. Do the negatives, do the positives outweigh the negatives? And if we've got some negatives, do I, you know, can I find lines to go to that don't have those negatives that we can try to lose them in the next generation by replacing that parent with, an, with a better offspring? That's what breeding is all about. 
So breed maintenance requires avoiding the popular sire syndrome, utilizing quality dogs from the breadth of your population to expand the gene pool, monitoring genetic health issues through regular breed health surveys, doing genetic testing for breed-related disorders, participating in open health registries to manage genetic disorders, we'll talk about that in the next half, and constant selection for quality and health. The reason why the public feels, and we do have problems with genetic disease in purebred dogs, and the reason is that people just breed dogs and think that there's, you don't have to breed for health, you just breed, you know, I'm breeding an Australian Terrier, it should be a healthy Australian Terrier. If you're not selecting for something, you're selecting against health. Okay, so, so we need to go back to the old time breeders that founded this breed and that formulated this breed. And, and yes, they were of a gentry class that that's all that they ever did, okay, was breed dogs, but they paid particular attention to the health of their dogs. And if they were not producing health, they were not used. And, that, and we need to go back to that, to that type of formula where, where we are, are strictly selecting for health as well as the quality of our dogs. Okay, that is the end of the first half.